there is a real sacrifice mm. to following Christ. And for, for some people, it may look like, like we're talking about how do we give sacrificially? Maybe I don't buy that thing. Maybe I, I budget a little bit more. Yeah. Maybe I tie them, give to missions. Like there are believers who are literally giving up everything mm. to say, yeah, no, I, I will follow Jesus. Yeah. Even if that means I lose these dreams of, of this world, yeah. you know, the, the life that uh-huh. I thought I would have, even if it means I'm going to live in exile yeah. for my own people, for my own family, uh, for the rest of my life. Wow. Um, because that's what it means to, to count the cost. Stephen, welcome to the happy hour. Thanks for having me, Jamie. It's exciting to have you here. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I hope, I hope it's a happy hour. It is a happy hour with our water and coffee. Yes. But you know what? A happy hour is not determined by water okay. or coffee. It's by what happens. That's the dumbest thing I've ever said in my whole life. So No pressure. Um, Steven, I met you in the fall mm-hmm. and um, at the same place that I was spoke about in the last episode that I was um, with David at a, an event for Radical. And I immediately, like literally, as soon as I, they showed your film, I was like, I need him on the happy hour right now. And so I'm glad you're here. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad to be here. All right. Introduce yourself to my listeners. All right. Well, I'm Steven uh, Morales. I work with Radical. I'm the content director there. Um, do a lot of storytelling, mainly uh, telling the story of uh, persecuted church, church in hard places, church in places where there's a lot of oppression, ideological oppression or persecution and trying to just bring more light and attention to that. I am from Guatemala originally. I've lived um, in between Guatemala and the U.S. and moved a couple different times, but now I'm currently based out of Guatemala City with my wife and two kids, a three-year-old and a, and an eighth months old, wow. a boy and a girl. So your wife is holding down the fort literally. Yes, without quite, you, well, quite literally, in yes. DC. Yes. Um, I have been to... Well, I still always say Guatemala, and here I am sitting next to you, and I'm like, I am such an American here, like... It's Guatemala. 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 Yeah. I've been once and it's so very beautiful. Awesome. Did you go for like I went with my friend. I went with my just, friend Jessica Honiger. She runs a um, fair trade jewelry business. Okay, cool. Day collection. And so I went with a trip down there. I met a bunch of her artisans that are creating jobs and creating jewelry. And it was really, really beautiful. That's so cool. We stayed in a great hotel. Man, I was like, I would go it. back here I, I try again. to get as many people as I can to come down and just experience it. See that there's a, there's a lot of that. So that, that's really cool. That you got to do it. It's very, very beautiful. But you also spent, you went to college in the States. I did. So I, I grew up in Guatemala, born there. Uh, but I'm also a U.S. citizen. And so for college, I went to a, uh, during school, I went to an international kind of like missionary school, mm-hmm. then went to college in St. Louis. Uh, Missouri Baptist University, small Christian university. And then after college, moved moved back to Guatemala to do church planting. Okay. And so planted a church. Uh, took a couple of years to figure all that out, find the right pe- group of people, you know, that, that sort of thing, doing it on God's timing. And uh, planted a church, and that's still there. Wow. Yeah. Uh, did I hear, did I, did you tell me that your parents were missionaries? So my parents, I, I, I did not grow up as a missionary kid, okay. but I was missionary adjacent. Tell like me I that. grew up around a lot of um, international people. So in, in my school, in my class, there was, you know, we had people from the UK, people from the US, people from the rest of Latin America, from, you know, Chile to uh, Colombia to, you know, Costa Rica and other countries. And so it was a kind of melting pot of, of cultures. And a lot of them were there in Guatemala serving as missionaries. I was just kind of, I don't know how I got in. I was just kind of another international kid in yeah. there. I, I've grown up, my family is uh, biracial, bicultural. So my mom is from Holland, from the Netherlands. And my dad is Guatemalan American. And so we grew up with just a little bit of, of everything. And yeah. so... Um, going to the States was not a crazy jump, right. you know, uh, uh, culturally, but it, it was a new experience. I had never lived there yeah. until I was, you know, 18. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a little, we're kind of all over the place culturally. Right. I can see how God has just used so many parts of your growing up and story to give you this heart for the nations. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about storytelling because we, we, we talked to David uh, on the Wednesday show and talked about like, what is an unreached people group? Yeah. Uh, heard a lot about Secret Church, which I also want to ask you more about that. But for you, storytelling, how does that fit in for you with your work with Radical and what you're doing? 
that's my second question. But yeah. first I want you to tell us why, how did you get into this love of telling stories? Well, I think it, it goes back a little bit to this, the, the way we grew up, uh, particularly in, in Spanish speaking cultures. I mean, stories are just, that's the way you talk. Like mm -hmm. you get together, you sit at the table and you tell stories. That's the jokes are best told in the form of a story. Yeah. Um, if you want to make a point, you don't just tell the person directly, like you tell a story about it mm -hmm. to get them to understand that. And so in my own family, um, my, my grandparents on, on both sides, I, th I think of my, my grandfather on, um, on my dad's side, he was a preacher, he was in ministry, he was a lawyer, but he loved telling stories. And when we got together pretty much every week, uh, you know, Sunday after church, like sitting around the table, he would like preach sermons to us and it was usually in the form of a story. Yeah. And uh, um, on my on my other side, my other grandfather was also in ministry. Um, he was from the Netherlands, uh, survived, lived through World War II, has a crazy story himself of how he came to know the Lord. And just was, I didn't see him as often growing up, but the times that I did, it was like spend all this time just absorbing the stories that you got. And so as I, as I started going into ministry and, and pastoring, church planting eventually, you know, ended up here at Radical. Um, I've worked a lot in the creative space, worked a lot in media production, and just realizing that the more that I was in environments where I was teaching the Bible or hearing the Bible being taught, what would stay with me the longest and what would really stick and kind of just would, I, I couldn't get it out of my head, was not always the, the exhortation piece of a sermon, but the, the story mm -hmm. of it, the narrative of, of, of crafting this, this idea maybe sometimes through an illustration or, or maybe through the, just the narrative of, of the Bible itself, yeah. realizing this is, is, is in itself the story of God. Yeah. And so when I realized, oh, I can actually be a more effective communicator because it works on me. Mm -hmm. So maybe it works the same way on yeah. other people yeah. when it's in the form, a form of a story. Yeah. Well, I mean, as you're talking, I'm thinking Jesus was just this phenomenal mm. storyteller. Yes. I was watching um, The Chosen mm -hmm. just this week. And there's a scene where Jesus is speaking to not only just disciples, but people in the city. And he says, he says, stories connect us all. Mm. And it, it was just this beautiful, like, video moment yeah. in, in the series. And I believe that so much, which is why I do my show. Like, mm -hmm. it is what I say, stories change the world. Your story affects the world right in front of you. Like, your story matters. And this is so true for everything that you're saying as well. And Jesus did that so well. Yeah. So when you're telling stories, how does that fit into your work at Radical? Yeah, so I started Radical um, last year. I've worked there for about a year. And my first, I had worked with them a number of times on, on, on different projects uh, before I worked there full time. But um, my first real uh, in-person experience was at this event with a lot of leaders uh, from the, around the world, different sectors. Um, who were just kind of sitting around and, and thinking deeply about the issues around, surrounding the church, the persecuted church, the unreached church, how do we reach them? And in that conversation, someone asked, we, we talk often about these uh, the unreached church or the unreached countries and persecuted churches as a place ca being called like red zones. Mm -hmm. like these are places where there are urgent physical and spiritual needs. And someone asked the question, well, why are the red zones red? Mm. And, so, and we started like listing some of the countries that are in these red zones. And I realized just how little I knew about, not just about like the church and my brothers and sisters in these places. Like, I don't know anything about these countries at all, like just in general. Mm. And realizing there was a story to be told there and that often... I don't know what your experience has been kind of in the missions space or like at, at your local church, but often the stories we tell about um, the international stories we tell about what's happening around the world can be very superficial mm -hmm. or, you know, kind of one dimensional of just like, this is whatever, this is Amir, mm -hmm. you know, and Amir was Muslim and now he's a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, praise God for that. But I don't know anything about how did he grow up? Why is that significant? What, what is, are the circumstances? What are the circumstances? Yeah. yeah. What are the results of that? What are the challenges <laughs> that he's facing? And so there's a lot more just like historical context, the geography of the place, the, the culture, the religion that makes it a more of a well-rounded story that we often don't get um, in our churches or in, in, in the media that, that gets shared. And so that 
realizing that and having conversations with Radical, it kind of led us to this place where Radical um, invited me to join their, their team to do pretty much that, like help, you know, tell those stories. And so uh, my position really isn't so much to, uh, to talk a lot, but really go and learn and listen from these people uh, all around the world that are in uh, vastly like different situations than, than our own. But surprisingly, there's a lot in common that we share in, mm. in Christ and in, in the gospel that um, we can learn from. And hopefully that will, that will move us and motivate us to do something about it. Well, even you saying like, there's so much that we have in common that we can learn from that, yeah. that brings down the idea that Christians on this side of the world have the best figured out mm. the best way to do things, yes. and all that thing, which is a common thought here yeah. that we may, I'll speak for you, you. Well, you have a, you, you're a U.S. citizen as well. So am, I'm going to yeah. loop you in with us. <laughs> I was going to give you a pass. I count on both sides. You count on both sides, but we, we can often feel that way. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, unless we're really aware mm. and, and, and kind of retrain our thoughts to not be that way. And so even your storytelling is helping that. Was that the first video that you, the first film that you made about why, what makes the red zones red? Yes, that was one of the first ones. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've we've told a, few, a number of different stories. Um, this one of the first ones that we came out with just kind of introduced this idea of um, the unreached, uh, the need, the 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 great imbalance, uh, as as we call it. Of there's this need for um, resources. There's so a third of the world, right? Over three billion people. Some people dis- little disagree on the numbers, but nobody disagrees with less. But yeah. It's it's at least a third. <laughs> at least you know? three billion. Yeah. At least three billion. Um, have yet to hear the name of Jesus, and not just hear it like they they heard it, but right. like actually understand, have a have a clear and accurate description, articulation of the gospel. Right. Um, they just don't have that, and so the question is how how does it how has it come to that when we live in a world that is so connected uh, via technology, via mm-hmm. travel, via things like that, that there would be so many people in this world that still have not heard this message. I mean, the church has been around for thousands of years, right? So how do we get to that point? And the answer is more complex than probably what you can do in just a 10 or 15 minute video. We're not going to solve this problem right now. Immediately. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But there, there are, there is a simple way of, of looking at it. And on, on the one hand, it's that these places to, it's a bit obvious, but these places are just really hard, right? Like they're really hard to enter. They're really hard to actually uh, create a, a gospel presence because mm-hmm. of um, their spiritual warfare, there's resistance, there are um, controlling, uh, there are other forces in this world right. that do not want this message mm-hmm. to get out. And so you see that in places like Iran or other places in the Middle East where at a, at a government level, like there are um, very clear actions that are being taken to um, to lower any possibility of, of Christianity or anything like that spreading, right? Like it is seen as like you are an apostate. You Mm -hmm. have betrayed your family, like culturally, just to even like mention Christianity. It's like you have betrayed your family. So, um, these places are just hard to begin with. Right. But the other side of it is that the kind of version of Christianity of Western Christianity, Americanized Christianity, comfortable Mm -hmm. Christianity is it's easy. Right? right like it's really easy to live in this world where we're not being persecuted mm-hmm. where everything we have pretty much everything available to us we're not we're not in anyone's you know on anyone's radar we're not causing right. any issues so like it's very comfortable to just stay in our lane over yeah. here and do things that are quote unquote easy yeah and so when you have those two realities paired up to each other like there's just really these places that are really difficult and these places that are actually kind of kind easy. Of easy to live in mm-hmm. um you don't really, when you live in the easy, you don't really want to engage with the difficult, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Which your films are helping people do that. Yeah. Which, you know, the question I asked David last time was like, how do we keep this on the forefront of our mind? And I think that, you know, them bringing you on to make these films has been like a great, a great step for helping American Christians realize, oh, it's different over mm. here. You know, you've, you've visited a lot of countries and spoken to a lot of um, people, believers and unbelievers. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Whenever I feel like things are kind of crazy and falling apart here in America, I have a friend um, 
who travels the world. I mean, she's in every country yeah. all the time. She's just like this massive evangelist traveling the world. You might have heard of her, Chris Kane. Mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. So I'll talk to Chris and I'll be like, listen, this everything's falling apart. And she's like, Jamie, the gospel is spreading around yeah. the world. Yeah. The church is growing. It's actually the opposite. It's actually p- Christians on the on the in the rest of the world are like, hey, what's happening in the US? <laughs> like, it seems like things are falling up, you know. You know? Like, You're right. <laughs> yeah. Um, is, is exactly right. And so she is such a good reminder for me. And spending time with you guys is also such a good reminder for me that like having your head focused here in America where things mm-hmm. can feel hard in whatever way that might be for America, this comfortable Christianity, but the gospel is spreading yeah. um, around the world and God is doing some phenomenal things. So tell me a little bit about your experience of meeting Christians, either in these persecuted countries or from unreached people groups. Um, what has that been like for you? And tell me how, um, encourage us in America listening for your experiences. Yeah. Um, around the world. Yeah. So obviously I live in Latin America in Guatemala and Guatemala is actually surprisingly, uh, very similar to the U S culturally. Okay. It's like the most, at least two part parts of the U S like the Bible belt, mm-hmm. you know, Guatemala is the most evangelical quote unquote, uh, nation in central America. Really? And Latin I didn't America know that. Okay. In terms of like per capita, For you sure. know, it's, uh, about 16 million people. And so, um, so there you run into a lot of the same issues, surprisingly, that you would in, in the States in terms of like cultural Christianity, a comfortable Christianity, kind of challenging that, um, that, that sort of culture. Um, but in many other places, uh, last year we were able to travel to, to Turkey. We traveled to Iran. Um, like I said, there, there is this kind of, when you talk to people, you realize you sometimes Christians get the criticism that, what Christians are trying to do through mission work is just export an Americanized version of, of right. Christianity right. Or, or just Western ideals mm-hmm. or things like that. Mm-hmm. But when you realize just how much work is actually being done in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East from indigenous believers who they're the ones actually going to the right. nations, you know, right. um, you realize that that's actually not very accurate mm-hmm. at all. I think about, um, I met when I was in Iran, I met the son of the first Christian Iranian martyr in, mm. in Iran. Um, this was back in the nineties. Uh, obviously in 79, the Islamic regime took over the government in Iran. It takes about nine to 12% of a population to overthrow the government, to start a revolution. And that's what the Islamic regime did. Uh, the Islamic regime is not actually representative of all of the people of Iran. They're actually a, a minority who are in power and doing everything to maintain that power, right? So they took over in 79. Immediately, the moment that that happened, um, every Christian ministry from the West, particularly from the U.S., pulled, pulled out. out. They had to pull out. Mm-hmm. And so um, leaving the Iranian church, which was still very young, uh, on its own. Mm. And this guy was telling me just the, his experience, uh, as the son of a church planter, um, of an Iranian church planter that when all of those ministries pulled out, they collectively wrote this letter, this kind of statement of the state of Christianity in Iran. And according to them, Christianity was done. Like, it's the over. People who pulled out the wrote people this who letter. Pulled out wrote this letter and just basically said, "This is the state of all of our work combined here. It's it's done. There's nothing can else can be done. Basically, like Christianity here is over." And wow. for the s- church, which was small at the time, to hear something like that so defeating, from, so defeating, they just felt like they had been completely abandoned. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, it, it was, it, it's kind of a. a damning like statement mm-hmm. almost yeah. like of, of how we view missions like oh we're not here anymore it's so done. nothing's happening here anymore you know when in reality even though they pulled out like god There's was still very god, yeah. present his spirit was still very present in iran and and the church slowly began to grow yes under a lot of difficulties in secrecy underground you know, doing whatever they could to meet in homes because there's no way you could at the time that you could meet publicly, even mm. today. It's very, very difficult. And so um, eventually, a few years later in the 90s, this guy, his, his father was uh, arrested and executed publicly. Mm. And he's one of the only people on record who is actually a, a public execution from the Iranian government. They try to, you know, push it, yeah. throw it under the rug and everything. But um, this only... Uh, 
it's, it's so encouraging to just listen to their stories and see how this, I don't know how that, how we would respond. Like if that were happening in our culture, in our, on our side of the pond today, but that small moment where everything seemed so bleak and everything seemed like it was going nowhere actually sparked and ignited. Like it's a pattern that we see in scripture, right? right? Persecution happens, the church spreads, Explodes. the church grows, and that has happened in Iran up to the point where it's gone from in the past 20 to 25, 20 to 30 years has gone from being a church of, some would say maybe there was 2,000 Christians, maybe there was like 20, 50 churches to over 2 million. Wow. And, uh, you know, according to some sources, the fastest growing church in the world right now is in Iran. Wow. And so you look at the history of Iran, the history of the church there, and it's just a history of an amazing, like, it wasn't, it wasn't us. You know, it mm. wasn't like American Christians or like missionaries who like made it all happen. Like, man, there was just a small seed of the gospel yeah. there. And under intense persecution, I mean, Iran is the only country with a, an Islamic theocracy. Mm. Like, like there's an Islam, Islamic like Pope, the Ayatollah, like yeah. to, to look at it, like he controls everything, every position in the government he can remove, he can put him back. Like they control everything. But, um, because the government continues to be corrupt, can, the economy continues to be terrible. Uh, people continue to feel oppressed. Mm -hmm. They've associated that and they go, wait, isn't, aren't, isn't the Islamic theocracy in charge? Like, shouldn't we be over, over this above this? but it still happens. And so that has created a discontentment in people with Islam yeah. in general. And so that, they're more that, open to the gospel. So they're more open to the gospel. So they're, yeah, so it's, exactly. So it's made it fertile ground for people to ask questions, to look for other answers, to look for answers elsewhere. And that sort of environment was just a perfect, perfect ground for, for the Lord to do his work. And Change so just educate me a little bit, um, because it is an Islamic nation, we have all of these followers of Jesus now, are they allowed to publicly be Christians? So on paper, uh, uh, technically it is uh, allowed, you, Christians are allowed, there's actually a tiny minority uh, of an ethnic group, of, of, there's Jews and, and Christians in Iran, but it is illegal for a Muslim to convert to Christianity. Oh, it's illegal. It's illegal. And Which most of the converts probably were Muslim. Mm -hmm. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And then uh, it's also, uh, well, I, I won't speak from my own experience because obviously I've only been there for a little bit, but I'll tell you what I heard, the stories that I heard from people who were there. I had a chance to meet with a number of Iranian believers who are now uh, outside of Iran. They were essentially forced to exile. And the stories that I heard, what they told me is they said, look, they'll put you in jail for some time, but they don't want to waste resources and money on you by keeping you in jail forever. So what they'll do is they'll put you in jail for some time, you'll get out, and then they'll just make your life impossible. Wow. And so the way that that looks like is, I was talking to, to one uh, young guy, and he had his own business, he had gone to school, he was essentially thriving, and he became a, he became a believer. And the moment that happened, he, he was, you know, he was a believer. He was not just, he didn't just receive the gospel, but he was sharing the gospel with people around him. And so he had a business and hired someone and, and started sharing the gospel with this guy. And after a while, turns out he did, you know this guy actually was a spy and worked for the government so one day he shows up to his business and the the doors are locked and the locks have been changed and so to he, his own to business. his own business and so he can't get in and so he goes to the authorities and starts asking questions saying hey i can't get into my own bit like some, something's happening here and they say oh no that business doesn't belong to you that's not yours it? It, it belongs to that guy all the paperwork here the government has says it belongs to the guy that he hired Wow. And so they took away his business. Similar stories to like other people. They said they were going to college. They became Christians. They started sharing the gospel. They go to the college and the college says, no, you're not, you're not registered here anymore. You're not a student here. We don't have any records of you. So you can't work and you can't go to school. You can't like further your education. You can't further your life. Um, talking to another couple, they were saying um, they became Christians. were sharing the gospel. Anytime they would go anywhere, so they would go to their friend's house or their uncle's house and uh, just, you know, go hang out, get, get tea, drink tea, have a meal, spend time together. As soon as they would leave, cops would show up to the house and just start harassing their family. What do they say? What are they talking about? Are you a Christian now? Whatever. So to the point where their family members would call them and say, hey, don't come, don't come to my house mm. anymore. Don't visit me anymore because every time you come over, I get harassed by the cops and I don't want my kids. And so yeah. like, it's just impossible to live your life. 
Mm. And so when you live, when life is like that, you have no choice but to leave. Yeah. And so for, for that reason, there are, um, uh, there's m millions of uh, Iranian refugees. Many have been displaced just because the government is, is oppressive to begin with. Right. But many of them are, are believers because as a believer, you just can't live mm. a normal life uh, in, in Iran. Mm. And so that's kind of the, the picture of, of persecution. But it's interesting because as Iranians have, have fled Iran and, and are making a life uh, for themselves in other places like, like Turkey, for instance, um, there are a, there's a growing number of, of uh, opportunities to do ministry with Iranians who, who are traveling back and forth mm -hmm. or with Iranians who live outside. Like um, there, are, there are millions of Iranians in, in Turkey um, and there's actually more Iranian Christians in Turkey than there are Turkish Christians right. just because so many have, have, have moved left, them before uh -huh. and have left. And so the nations are kind of spreading out beyond their borders. And, and if you want to reach Iran, you don't necessarily have to go Either into Iran. Iran. There's like, there's a lot of Iranians in, in other places. And surprisingly, like culture, they're just very open to getting answers in other places and wow. asking questions mm -hmm. and, and finding out more about, about your, what you believe and why you believe it. And so, um, so, I'm just consistently like encouraged by yeah. by the stories that I hear, particularly this guy who uh, the the son of the the, the Iranian martyr. Um, he he had just finished. He he was forced to leave Iran um, last year, and he had just finished building what he told me was his dream house. Mm. He said, "Man, I had just spent like so much money. Like my wife and I, like this was the house that we always wanted. Wow. Like growing up." And it was a house where they they hosted a church, right? Yeah. They said, and several other churches came out. Um, and the police came and knocked on their door and said, um, "Hey, we know you're a pastor." This is after they finished building the house, right? They said, "Hey, we know you're a pastor. So here's what we're going to do. We uh, we're actually we're going to start a church, a Christian church hosted by by the Iranian government, and it's going to be uh, like the government sanctioned church. And we want you to be the pastor. And if you're the pastor," Man, we'll give you. We'll make sure you're well taken care of financially. You have everything. You you will never be harassed again. You know you're uh, you're gonna be. You know we'll put you in front of people uh -huh. like you're gonna be yeah. the guy like government stamp approval. But obviously there's strings attached. The yeah, gonna, yeah, a lot of a lot of strings attached, right? Essentially, you you do what we say, mm -hmm. and you say what we say. You teach what yeah. we want you to teach, right? And immediately he was like, No, I'm I'm not down for that. Yeah. Um, and after hours of being interrogated and, you know, they took his wife away, his children away, they put him in different rooms and tried to interrogate him all and everything, realized they weren't going to do anything. They weren't going to accept that offer. And so the police just completely trashed the house. Mm. Um, and, uh, they got to the point, I mean, they, they, they had children they had the other point that were, they had to leave and yeah. leaving for them wasn't like, all right, we'll get on a plane and go. Like they walked like across the mountains and had to cross the border and leave the country. And so... There is a very real, like when we talk about like you have, there is a real sacrifice mm. to following Christ. And for, for some people it may look like, like we're talking about how do we give sacrificially? Maybe I don't buy that thing. Maybe I, I budget a little bit more. Yeah. Maybe I tie them, give to missions. Like there are believers who are literally giving up everything mm. to say, yeah, no, I, I will follow Jesus. Yeah. Even if that means I lose these dreams of of this world yeah you know the the life that uh -huh. i thought i would have even if it means i'm gonna live in exile yeah for my own people for my own family uh for the rest of my life wow um because that's what it means to to count the cost i was telling you i read the article last night in christianity today about the 50 hardest mm. places to countries to be a christian yeah and i found myself I, I skimmed it i need to go back and read it but i found myself asking myself yeah would you, would you, would you, would you survive? Would you say this? Like when mm. you're telling that story and like my husband's a pastor, I'm like, would we let them trash our house and say, yeah. and, and I want to say yes, you know what I mean? But mm. the thing is, I, I'm probably never going to experience that here right. in America. And so it's just the sobering reality of what our brothers and sisters have to endure. Mm. You said this family fled to Turkey and you've spent time in Turkey mm. um, and have some videos about that, which by the way, we're gonna link to every video you have released, awesome. all of the things, um, because 
I am a fan and love them and you're doing such good work. But let's talk about Turkey for a minute yeah. where Turkey used to have more Christians than it does today. Is that what you would say? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So um, Turkey is like particularly significant in church history and like just the history of like how Christianity spread out around the world. Right. So um, we talk a little bit about in this video, uh, we did like a short documentary explainer video about, about Turkey, um, called, uh, how the Christian capital of the world became Muslim. And essentially like when you look at the seven churches in revelation, um, those are all in Turkey. If Paul's missionary journeys went through Turkey, when Constantine, um, emperor of, of the Roman empire, uh, converted to Christianity and made Christianity the state religion uh, of the empire uh, he did that in constantinople which is present-day istanbul in turkey right so um it's just very a significant lot a lot of a lot of history a lot of growth there um and so and that's just you know scratching scratching the surface so but that's really where christianity blew up mm -hmm. and so um it was cool because we got to go and kind of experience some of that history um like the Nicene Creed, which mm -hmm. is this this creed that basically establishes like some of the foundational beliefs of like what it means to follow wh who who is Jesus, who uh -huh. is God, uh, the Trinity, all these things were that was all written in in Turkey. We went to like the ruins of the places where like that was where it's believed that that was written and compiled. Like all of that was Constantine telling the church for the first time ever, like openly, no longer persecuted. Like hey, gather for mm. a month and talk about and discuss like what it is it what is it that christianity actually believes yeah and so all that was was turkey there was cathedrals like it's just huge um but you know fast forward a couple hundred years obviously i'm going like super super fast through through hundreds of years of history here but um ottoman empire comes in uh there's wars are fought crusades things like that ultimately christianity loses Armenian genocide. There's like so many things contributing to um, the growth of Islam mm -hmm. in Asia, in the Middle East, and ultimately in Turkey. And uh, about a hundred years ago, maybe the Christianity there was it was about it went down to about like twenty percent, wow. being twenty percent Christian. Uh, and this is a country of uh, today, you know, eighty six million people, eighty nine between eighty six and eighty nine million people. Um, and over the last hundred years, that has only as as Islam and secularism has grown, that number has gone all the way down to zero point two percent. And so it is so about one hundred seventy thousand Christians in a country of eighty nine million, and that's just Christians like including Catholics, uh -huh. like everything, like Orthodox, like everything. And so it's just a smaller sliver of that are Protestants. Um, and so it is really hard to find. Uh, Christians in in Turkey and so would it be a red in the red zone mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 that that Christianity uh, today article about the the top 50 places uh -huh. it's in the top yeah. it's in the top 50 I think it's probably in the top like 20 yeah. and so um, it, it's weird because the country that you would go it's technically not illegal to be a Christian but uh, since it is so since being a, 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 the nationalist identity of Turkey is Muslim okay. and so if you are a good Turk you you're are, a Muslim. You're a Muslim. And so because of that, just like culturally and in family life, society life, like if you're a Christian, you can't be in any sort of government government position, authority position, police for education, all of those things. Like it's just really hard. There can't be Christian seminaries or like higher education institutes, uh, things like that. Just not that, allowed. Not allowed. Not allowed. Um, there are churches, though, and it is technically legal to be a Christian. It's just there's a lot of what I'm describing, like what I've described is just like harassment mm -hmm. and making your life impossible yeah. as a Christian. And so um, even while we were there, it was really hard to find people to, to talk to mm -hmm. for, for this, you know, I would imagine because it's just so <laughs> the, the, the pool is just yeah. so small. And so uh, it, it's just fascinating to see how a place that was so dominantly Christian mm -hmm probably the has completely turned around right like yeah. place that you would go you know maybe a thousand years would go oh man i can't imagine us ever living in but in a culture that would be dominantly a completely different right. religion right like yeah. how do you make that switch yeah and so like a really good example of that is um and we talk about this in the video is there's this cathedral called uh, Hagia sophia and uh it was actually built like named after the emperor's mother sophia and so it was built as a Christian, as a Christian cathedral. Mm -hmm. 
and you walk in and it feels like a like if you've been to like spain or yeah. like anywhere else in europe you're like this is it's massive yeah. you know um it was at one point the largest building on earth and uh but today it was turned into a museum for some time but then today it was actually turned into a mosque okay and so you walk in today and, and it just feels like just eerie like something's mm. off because it looks kind of like a cathedral but then they they later built these minarets outside and you walk inside and it's all carpeted you have to leave your shoes at the Mm -hmm. door and where usually there would be like you know like catholic frescoes and Mm -hmm. you know uh, or orthodox iconography or things like that like it's all just like crucifixion yeah yeah. like it's all just like arabic writing like the geometric patterns and Mm -hmm. abstract art of of islam uh, of islamic architecture and it literally is covering what yeah. was there before. And so when it was a museum, you could actually go out. They have like these beautiful tapestries of the apostles and things mm-hmm. like that. All that is like upstairs and like, or I don't know, in storage it, somewhere, but yeah. you can't see it. You can't yeah. see it anymore. And so it really, it's, it's a great example. It's like a microcosm of like Turkey in general, right. where it's like this place that used to be so dominantly Christian is mm-hmm. no longer, it's no longer that. And so you have this kind of melting pot now of it's, majority islam but there's there's a ton of there's a a, a strong secularist force there Mm -hmm. as well yeah um and and that makes it a really um difficult and stifling environment for Mm. for gospel advancement Mm. you talked about people from iran coming in Mm -hmm. and it feels like nations reaching nations yeah which i think is like another conversation for Mm -hmm. another day that is is so exciting but when they're coming into turkey it is a release for them as right because they can now live freely as a follower of Jesus, Correct. even though there's let there's, you know, not right. as many. Okay. That makes sense. Um, you know, we talked, I talked on Wednesday with David about secret church mm-hmm. and, um, what we didn't talk about is the, the format of it. Yeah. And so the reason I want to talk with you about that is because you're going to be releasing some films during that. So tell us about the films that you're going to be releasing during secret church, which I yeah. said, I said with David, anyone can go and sign up and uh, mm-hmm. it's secretchurch.org, and yep. it comes out next Friday. And so you can be a part of it, get a group together, get your family. Um, and then I believe it'll be available for a little bit of time after if you're listening to this later, but what are you releasing at secret church? Yeah. So we've, we've We've done this event, Secret Church, um, for many, many years, for longer than I've been at Radical, um, where David uh, takes, um, it's essentially an intense time in in the Word Mm -hmm. uh, to really dive deep into a book of the Bible or a topic on the Bible um, and learn it the way many Christians have to around the world, right? Um, They only have a small window uh, of time, small opportunity to all sit together, and so they take they make the most of it right yeah. and they dive deep and and so that's what that that night is about um but it's also time for us to highlight kind of stories of what god is doing around the world and so um we started a series that these, these videos that you mentioned uh called neighborhoods and nations where every week we're we're traveling to different places telling the story of god's work in 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 hard to reach places and f- we're kind of tying those things in together with secret church so there'll be four there's usually there are four sessions of teaching uh this year it'll be on on the book of jonah and in between those four sessions there's three um episodes or segments where we will be in iran uh like we actually got to go to iran and uh and meet people there meet the church there tell their story and so it's it's a time of diving deep into the word but also just seeing how the word has gone out into unexpected and difficult places around the world particularly iran um so it's it'll be fun it'll it'll be exciting I'm super excited about it. And like I said, it's secretchurch.org. You guys can go look it up. Steven, I love the work that you're doing with neighborhoods and nations. Um, in fact, I wanted to say this. You, you you wrote this somewhere, and you said, we want to experience the stories of people and places that we often only see as prayer bullet points or news headlines. Mm. And I think that is a desire of a lot of people here, that yeah. they're yearning uh, for that as well. And so you are creating a space for that. And so thank I'm you. grateful for you, and thank you for coming on the happy hour. I want to ask you, what are you reading these days? Man, um, so is it okay if it's not a Christian book? Oh my gosh! Okay, yes. I just want to know if I'm breaking You're a on rule the happy there. Hour. Okay, cool. Well, it um, I'm reading a book right now. is actually given to me by my producer uh, called "The Power of Geography." Okay, uh, by Tim Marshall. I don't know if you know him. He's a reporter. He's he's literally gone to like every country in the world yeah. and uh, and stayed there and got to know it. 
uh, really well. And so, but what I love about him is he, his, each chapter is like a different book and it just kind of, or, or yeah, it's a different country. Um, and each one reads kind of like a Wes Anderson Ooh, script. Like, okay. you know, where like in these Wes Anderson movies where there's like this exposition narration is kind of like giving you the context of yeah. a place or uh-huh. the story. And so it's just, just reads really well. Uh-huh. And so um, I just kind of read it in like Adrian Brody's voice or, <laughs> or Ralph Fiennes or something the whole yeah. time. And it was like a British accent at least. And so uh, I love it just because I, I'm on this kick currently of there are so many things I do not know about the rest of the world right. that I'm, I'm trying, trying, to, yeah. trying to learn, right? Learning mode. And so uh, that book, he's got a couple uh, different ones. Um, they're all like New York Times bestsellers, yeah. Prisoners of Geography, uh, The Power of Geography. And so I would recommend it to anybody who Ooh, I just... Love it. The each, I mean, it, it's a good way to just like get a quick idea of like the history of a, yeah. of a, of a place. As someone who I'm sure you like, you love movies, I would guess. Yes. What is one of the best movies you've seen recently? Um, man, uh, well, this is after the Oscars, right? So, uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. You know, I, don't I haven't know if you've seen, seen it. That. No, I'm like the only oh one that has gosh. it. But my son, who is really into films and yeah. he actually wants to be, um, in the industry loves that movie. Yeah, it is wild. I mean, it was like a super, uh, small budget, but they made the most of it. Yeah. And so if it's like the whole multiverse, I know that that's like mm-hmm. common, that, uh-huh. like all the Marvel movies are, this is like the best actual multiverse approach to telling that sort of story. Okay. And so uh, I loved it. I'm going to listen to you on that, but we usually when people say multi- multiverse, I say I'm out. Like I, know, I just, I know, I'm no, not no, really know, into that kind of stuff. I, and I get it. Like it, the whole Marvel thing. I'm like, not, it, that's not it. At okay. All. Okay. Okay. Like, this is a completely different take. So I've heard that. Yeah. So I've, I have heard it's that. It's great. It's great. Um, Steven, thank you so much for coming on the happy hour and everyone go find neighborhoods and nations. You can get it on YouTube, but we'll put links all in the show notes so you guys can find it. Um, and don't forget to register for secret church at secretchurch.org. It is live next Friday. So super excited about that. Steven, thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie.